Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Do, should I stand here for the microphone or maybe I can just walk around and yell? That's all right, huh? Um, first off, I'm not going to do anything as entertaining as that video. That was just, that was a sound check. Um, thanks for inviting me here. It's a, a great opportunity to think about some things that have been going on and try and distill some, something that would be worthy of, of, uh, of such an audience. Let's see, I thought first I would just sneak in a little plug for the Robotics Institute and also it's an opportunity to show you another entertaining video <laughs> before we get to the dull stuff. Uh, mainly what I've been thinking about for the past four or five years is about hands. And so I wanted to share with you some of that uh, thinking about uh, the trade-off between simplicity and generality of hands. And, uh, and we do actually have some uh, work to show you a kind of a start on uh, developing simple hands that could still be pretty general. And, and then there's some more kind of, uh, you know, speculation at the end. So, uh, and, and please feel free to interrupt at any time. Uh, probably more fun the more interactive it is. Uh, let's see, so to start, the Robotics Institute. Uh, we're called an institute. Uh, we started out as an institute, but about uh, 20 years ago, we actually became a department. So we have, you know, the whole like tenure track thing, and we have a PhD program and some master's programs. So it's really a department, except it's really still a research institute. It's been growing and growing, and what grows without bound seems to be the research, the sponsored research. Uh, and you can see that when you look at the demographics. So uh, we have, we're very big, we've got 500 technical people working. Uh, only 15% of those are faculty. And of those faculty, uh, more than half, about two thirds of them are actually on soft money. So they're research faculty. Uh, they're completely engaged. We have a kind of equality thing going on between the two tracks, but, uh, but most of them are doing research uh, and only a third or so are really engaged in the teaching. Uh, you also notice we have this enormous technical staff because a lot of the research projects just take an awful lot of engineering. Uh, the sponsored research budget is $55 million. I guess that number probably doesn't mean a lot to most of you. But uh, for comparison, it's about one-sixth of CMU's entire sponsored research budget. So we're a uh, really, really big research institute focused on robotics in sort of a smallish university. Uh, if you're curious about where that money's coming from, uh, well, you can see actually this. Uh, so those top two blue stripes are the money that's associated with the education mission. That's, you know, tuition and university contributions and so forth. And everything else is sponsored research. So we started at about a million dollars a year from Westinghouse here. And then uh, you can see DOD funding has grown and grown. This was mostly for unmanned ground vehicles. We have a lot of people that build autonomous trucks and cars and things like that, which DOD was really excited about, and then that's kind of waned a little bit and been replaced with more commercial funding. Uh, I guess I won't walk through this list, but there are some things on here that most people don't think of necessarily as robotics. I mean, vision, is vision robotics or not? Most people in the computer vision community, when they say the word robotics, they mean something else. They don't mean vision, right? And likewise, the computer graphics group, uh, most people don't associate that with robotics, but we, we are doing those things. Um, and maybe the other thing I should point out is, uh, you know, there's a trend, not just at CMU, but I think throughout the robotics world to look at applications that are more directly engaged with people. Uh, so, you know, in the old days, we used to talk about dull, dirty, dangerous, the three Ds. Uh, because it was easy to motivate robotics, 
by saying, well, you know, we don't want people to have to go down in the mines and, you know, it's outer space is dangerous. We want robots for those things. But nowadays, I think we have a better story, which is that you really do want robotics technology to be working with people and helping people. So that's uh, something that's, I think, a pretty great thing about robotics generally. I'm just going to show you a couple of videos. Uh, this is, I guess, probably the biggest day in the history of the Robotics Institute. So this was the Urban Challenge, which happened a few years ago. And uh, is that annoying siren? People that worked on that team can't even hear the siren anymore. They have, they've, they came, became accustomed to it. Uh, it was really, it's, it felt like a really historic day, not just because of what happened at CMU. In fact, it, it, when you were there, it seemed like not so much a competition as a collaboration. There was a lot of sharing and uh, a lot of universities had uh, really great systems going. And uh, uh, well, and, and let's see, here's the other video I want to show you. This is actually my, my favorite Robotics Institute video. Maybe I'll just turn this down a minute and tell you what's going on. So, uh, some really great video of Tokyo here. The guy in the white coat is Hideki Kojima, and he is actually, he is not an actor, he's a real roboticist. He actually developed the hardware that you're looking at. The, the little robot's name is Keepon. He has a, a microphone in his nose, his eyes are cameras. Um, a lot of these behaviors you're seeing are autonomous. So the dancing behavior is autonomous. Uh, he does hear music and auto automatically generates the dancing. And he, with his eyes, he can watch you and sometimes see what you're doing and sort of play imitation games with you. So it was actually developed as a system to interact with autistic children uh, who, for reasons that I don't understand, you know, can sometimes relate to technology in ways that they find difficult with humans. The story behind the video is that, that Keepon was a sort of a YouTube sensation and the band Spoon kind of uh, got interested and then Wired Magazine got interested. So it was actually Wired Magazine that produced the video. We can't make videos this great. <laughs> Maybe, uh, I know this is more entertaining than the rest of my talk's going to be, but I'm going to stop. I do think it's really interesting how even very, very simple things, it's only four degrees of freedom. It's, it's, in terms of its motion, it seems like it doesn't have a lot, but it's very expressive, right? And, and people really uh, relate to it. They've won some, you know, human computer interaction conference best paper prizes and things like that. Uh, so there's something about simplicity, and I guess that'll be sort of my segue to talking about hands. Um, 
Basically what happened was a, a few years ago, um, I was thinking about uh, some things that have been going on recently, in particular, or two in particular. Uh, so one is that the uh, military forces in uh, the Middle East have started using uh, robots to help deal with uh, makeshift bombs. And so they have these mobile platforms that are out there and they, sometimes they have arms and hands on them. The hands are very, very simple. And they use them to deal with bombs and uh, it's been so successful. There have been several thousands of them shipped over there. And, um, and yet, the thing is they're being teleoperated. That is, there's a human with a controller that's at a distance and watching through a camera and directly controlling the motions of the hand and arm. And to me this is like an affront to the robotics research community because basically despite 20 or 30 years of research, we haven't really given them much help in controlling those things. There's no autonomy to them at all. And, um, and, and it seems like there's something wrong there, but there's also a great opportunity because uh, this is just going to grow and grow. Uh, it's not just for makeshift bombs. I mean, my other example is the uh, Da Vinci surgical robot. So this is a system that has little laparoscopic tools and they do surgery, whether they do prostate uh, surgery, I think is the number one application. And, you know, people talk about it as robot surgery. But again, it's actually teleoperated. There's a human being, a doctor, a surgeon, who's in the master rig and he's directly controlling all the motions of the robot. And again, it seems like we should have been able to help them more than we have. And there's an opportunity there. Uh, you know, the systems are deployed. Uh, I think uh, somebody told me that Intuitive Surgical, it's making the Da Vinci, is a billion dollar company. Uh, the stuff's, it's a tremendous opportunity and we really need to do something about it, you know, but, but what? So uh, that's kind of where I started. Um, one thing you notice is that a lot of the research in robot hands has been focused on systems like this that are anthropomorphic and extremely complicated, although, well, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, it's been a wonder over the last 10 or 20 years how much simpler they've become. So this hand that we're looking at right here has all the motors, actuators, and transmission and sensors all inside the hand. It's quite a remarkable system. But the systems that are actually being used, like in teleoperation, uh, are systems like this. This is, I think, used for underwater um, teleoperation. It's a very, very simple thing, right? It has it's a simple claw, and I don't think it has any sensors at all. And, uh, you know, I think the answer from robotics research is that, you know, we've been more interested in that, but the answer from the customers, from the people that are really using the technology is they seem to want the one on the right. Neither one of them are autonomous. They're being teleoperated in either case. Which one do we want? Well, you know, the answer is it depends. There's certainly things that you can't do with the one on the right that uh, you could do with the one on the left. Or so we think. It actually is not proven. Um, one little observation to make about this, I mean, we look at this because, and we say, well, this has got to be great because it looks a lot like this. And we know that this is great. Um, but when you think about it, we have two of these, right? We've got two of the complicated ones, but we have uh, dozens of the simple ones, right? If you go in your kitchen or your garage or whatever, you're going to find lots and lots of very, very simple little manipulation tools. So when you think you're emulating a human being by worrying about the one on the left, that's not the whole story, right? The gold standard isn't the human hand. It's a human being with a toolbox, with a whole collection of, uh, of, of, of tools, including the simple ones. Well, so that's sort of uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, how do you think about the difference between simple hands and complex hands? And, and you know, the real question is just, just how general could a hand like that be? Um, could, it, could it pick parts from a bin 
This is an industrial problem that people care about. If you have a bunch of disorganized parts in a bin, could you, can you pick them out and assemble a product or whatever it is you want to do? Um, well, could it operate scissors? It doesn't look like it could operate scissors, does it? It seems rather unlikely. Could it open a door? Looks like probably it could. Could it fold origami? Seems like that's asking a lot, right? That seems, I would say, hopeless. Um, well, okay, so that's the question. What can simple hands do? Can they be general? It turns out there's actually good reasons to think about complex hands. And again, the human example is probably the best example. So this is Julia Child. Can you see it? You can't see it? I'll show it again. And you need to pay attention because there's going to be a quiz. That's all right. Look at that. Okay, well, so what's going on here? First off, I was just really jealous because I have friends that are doing stuff with motion capture and I was afraid they were going to learn how manipulation works and I'd be out of the picture. And, uh, and then I, I thought, well, I, I was actually, I was lying in bed one morning and I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll just take notes. I'll look at everything I do with my hands all day. I'll take notes and I'll just, you know, direct observation. And I did that for about two hours and, uh, and I had about, uh, in that amount of time, I think I recorded like 300 different manipulation thingies. But it was a rather coarse resolution. It was like, grab the knob, pull open the cabinet door, let go of the knob, grab the cereal box. And it really wasn't that interesting. So I really wanted a way to study things more closely. And that's when I had this idea that there's hours and hours of data out there of Julia Child doing some pretty interesting stuff with her hands and uh, with, with cameras focused right in. So I went and got season one. I watched the first episode. I didn't learn anything. It was actually, you know, it was kind of discouraging. Uh, I was just seeing things that we all see all the time and we're used to it. It was no big deal. So then I thought, well, I've got to go back and we'll look at it more closely. And I watched the first like 15 minutes, I still didn't get anything, you know. So then I went back and started watching it frame by frame. And I saw some things that really surprised me. So, well, let's see, let me, so here's the quiz. Let's see if any of these things surprise you. Here's the first question. Well, okay, this is just a kind of background question. How many objects did she manipulate? Two. 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 Okay, I have a different answer. Three. So the three being the knife. The potato. So maybe I'm just maybe I just count. So I, I count all the slices too. <laughs> so I count uh, for 47 objects. So we'll come back. I you know I don't I don't claim to have the right answer on these things. How many objects did she pick up? That's really that's interesting, isn't it? It's not very many. Uh, in fact, the answer I got, we'll go back and look at it again, the answer I got is maybe one. It's like picking up, when you're doing robotics research, you, you know, so many people that are working on hands are worried about grasping, and the idea is you're going to go with your hand, and you're going to surround the thing, and you're going to fix it with respect to the hand, and then you're going to do this. Um, and she never does that. Not once does she do that. There is a place in there where she kind of grabs one half of the potato and kind of flips it over. And I'm not sure if she ever even lifts it off the table. So we'll, we'll go back and look at that. Okay, here's this one. Where was the knife when she was handling the potato? It's still in her hand. Uh, it's a kind of funny grasp. So uh, here's some white. <laughs> she's, she's handling the potato with her thumbs and fingers, and she's got the knife in this kind of funny grasp that I never really noticed before and which you don't see in the typical taxonomies that are published of human grasp. 
Uh, so, I don't know, we'll call it maybe a hind finger grasp. Let's go back and look at this video again. And uh, hang on a sec. How do I uh, yeah, go back? And then you look at this thing in detail. The first thing is she picks the knife up and picks it back down. Just before, so there's the picking up and putting down again. Just before she begins to cut, she changes the angle. And I'm not sure whether that's her stiffening her arm or getting a, a better angle for slicing the potato or what. And then the next thing that occurs to me is why, uh, why is that half of the potato falling like that? Maybe she's torquing the knife as it's coming down and it kind of snaps the potato off. I know when I cut slices myself, sometimes it seems like there's a powerful kind of force between the potato and the knife, like there's some suction working or something. And uh, she just doesn't, see, oops, she doesn't seem to have that problem. Uh, let's see then, so here's, uh, yeah, for some reason she doesn't like that one. Here comes the so-called pickup. So it does leave the table, but I'm not sure she ever had what people in robotics would call a stable grasp. And you can see that hind finger grasp there of the knife. So there's a million things you see when you start looking at it frame by frame. So in the end, I ended up pretty much totally occupying my attention with the first 14 seconds of the first episode of the first season of, uh, of Julia Child. Here's another one, origami. And this one is just as interesting and yet it seems like whatever lessons I learned from watching the first one seem very different. I think I'll just stop it there and go back. I have one question here. How many errors did you see? There's a lot of errors in this. So, uh, and, and it's remarkable how quickly uh, the error recovery process happens. So here, look at this grasp on the left. So there it commences. Three frames later it fails. One, two, three, four, five. I mean after four or five frames the error recovery has commenced. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 14, 15, 16, 17, 19, 20. After 20 frames, I guess I'd say it's fully corrected, right? So this is 30 frames a second. That's less than a second. You know, it takes 40 milliseconds, I think, for a nerve impulse to travel from a sensor to a motor. So it's amazing how fast this happens. And you see this over and over again in this video. You see places where uh, there was an error. Did you see that? Oh, I thought, uh, hang on a sec. Did I miss it? I mean, the finger lifted free, it snagged the paper and it lifted free in the space of, so there it snagged it, two, three, four, and now it's lifting free. Five frames later it's free. One sixth of a second. Just don't know how that can happen unless, I don't know, you know, it's all compiled in, right? How, how is this happening? I don't know. There's a point here where you can see he's actually doing two different grasp operations at the same time. And whichever one works first, that's the one he goes. So here you've got a plan that's like highly contingent and yet very speedy right there. Well, anyway, so enough of that stuff. That's what we see humans doing with their astonishingly complex hands. Um, on the other hand, uh, this is the kind of thing you see happening in industrial automation. I'll
turn the sound up. Sound is fun. So this is a system that assembles Sony Walkman tape recorders. Well, it used to. I think <laughs> you were there when we had this system running, weren't you? Yeah. Um, what this thing is, it has a turret head and every, when it wants to grasp a different object, it rotates the turret to a different tool. And each tool is incredibly simple. A single degree of freedom or maybe a little suction or something like that. Every hand is designed specifically to grasp one particular part. And, um, and I think it's that experience that causes robotics researchers to associate simplicity with uh, hopelessly specialized function. Let me skip on to the next. Well, so summarizing, summarizing that, there's, there's different arguments to be made for complexity. Uh, in the examples, in our experience, you see a real strong correlation. The complex hands do all kinds of complicated stuff. The simple hands are incredibly specialized. Um, but there's other arguments, good arguments actually, I would say irresistible arguments. Um, here's one kind of based on geometry. I mean, what is grasping? In order to grasp something, you have to have some confirmation of shape of the hand to the shape of the object. And in applied mechanics and mechanical engineering, we have a measure for the varieties, the different ways that you can conform shape. That's what degrees of freedom is. It formalizes that concept. So the more degrees of freedom you have in your hand, the greater its ability to conform to a variety of shapes. Um, sometimes you want to manipulate things in the hand, right? And uh, to do that, obviously you need more freedoms. There's a simple argument that you have to have at least nine. And the argument is this, if you want to control this shape, you can't do it very well with two points because you can't control rotations about the axis through the two points. So you need at least three. And if you want to have arbitrary motions of the object, when you've got three points attached to it, each one of those points has to be able to move in three directions, X, Y, and Z. And if you want to do that in a controlled way, you need nine motors. So that logic is actually a very powerful argument that I think is, has had a huge impact in robotics research. Um, and the last argument has more to do with sensing, right? If you want to do haptic perception, then you want to have lots of sensors. And if you want to move those sensors around, you want to have more freedoms. So there are lots of good arguments for a complex hand. I think the best argument is the simplest one. If we're going to like take the entire hand design space and completely eliminate you know, everything outside of more than two or three freedoms or two or three sensors away from the origin of that design space, then you've just eliminated almost all of, of possible hand designs. Surely those such design constraints will have some consequences. So that, I think, is the case for complexity. Let's look at simple hands, though. Um, so here's uh, a Da Vinci robot. So this is the system I was talking about before that's usually used for prostate surgery. Doctors uh, want you to think that they're very busy all the time, but obviously they've, they've got time to <laughs> fool around with origami. Um, so this is, of course, teleoperated. This is not autonomous. Robots, an autonomous robot cannot do that. Uh, but a surgeon operating through this teleoperation rig can. Now notice that those grippers are single degree of freedom grippers. They're very simple. There is uh, no haptic feedback. The doctor is working entirely with visual feedback. And, you know, when I showed you the craft uh, manipulator, single degree of freedom manipulator, and said, obviously it can't fold origami. Nobody was arguing, right? It, it seems hopeless. This is obviously better suited to origami, but it's not significantly more complex. So it's pretty astonishing. Well beyond what I think most of us would imagine that simple hands can do. And there's lots and lots of examples like that. A human with a prosthetic hook. Sorry, yes. Why can't the robot do that? Um, what is the main 
Well, let's see. So there's, there's two possible answers. <laughs> this video isn't going to be very interesting, is it? <laughs> Uh, there's two possible answers. One is that manipulation is really hard, and the other is that roboticists just aren't that smart. And um, I think they're probably both true. Um, now, you're probably looking for a more detailed answer. What are the technological barriers? Um, and my short answer to that is it's mostly, you know, up here. The primary organ of manipulation is the brain and not, not the hand. Um, so, I don't know, let's, let's, let's ask the question again at the end and see if we can get any further. Um, we can't, but uh, let's pretend. <laughs> um, yeah, humans with prosthetic hooks, if you've never watched somebody with a prosthetic hook, uh, it's, it's quite amazing what they can do. Um, I'm going to show you a, a hardware pickup tool in a second. Chopsticks, right? Uh, amazing the feats of dexterity that people do routinely if, if they're you know, if they're good. Roulette croupiers, lots and lots of different examples uh, like that. So simple hands really can do a lot. Um, and then the rest of the case is for simplicity is things like, I mean, why, why do the bomb disposing robots want to have simple hands? It's because they're very robust, they're very cheap, they don't weigh very much, all of these things matter. I actually think there are scientific benefits that you can learn something by working with simpler hands that ultimately will apply more generally and it might be easier to learn those principles when you're working with a simpler system. Uh, and this last argument I made before, the real gold standard is, is not the human, it's the human with, its, with its, his or her, or her tools. So um, let me just show you a few examples there. This is... <laughs> yeah. What does it say, 73? You know, they're showing you this teletype so you'll be impressed with how advanced their technology is. <laughs> this is a system that uh, could assemble a toy locomotive. And notice it's got a variety of shapes. It's got a vision system. It's got a very simple gripper, a parallel jaw gripper. And uh, it works pretty well. Um, this next one, I think this might be the most impressive autonomous manipulation system. <laughs> um, these motions are all generated automatically. This is my uh, colleague Michael Erdman. Um, you could take an arbitrary polygonal shape, you could tell it what the uh, weight distribution is, tell it where the center of mass is, and he's another coefficients of friction, and then it could figure out all the possible manipulations of the block and then search for plans to achieve whatever reconfiguration of the block you desire. So there is autonomous manipulation, some of it with very simple hands, uh, but it falls far short of origami or surgery. Oh yeah, one other example. This is now about two years old. Maybe this is actually the most advanced autonomous manipulation system. Um, a lot of times videos like this are sped up. Okay, when you look at the videos, a lot of times you'll see in the corner where it says 10x or 50x or something like that. This is 1x. Uh, so this is uh, Siddhartha Srinivasa's personal robotics lab at Intel. Um, I guess that's a proof that this is not sped up. Or he could be, maybe he's developed a skill of moving really, really slowly. <laughs> uh, but it is autonomous and these things are not programmed in detail by humans. Uh, you know, you could give the robot a different starting position. It's using its own sensors. It has LiDAR systems, generates point clouds, does visual object recognition, does path planning on the fly, does grass planning on the fly, and yet you know, I mean, have you ever seen a refrigerator that's that clean? <laughs> this is, so one of the things they've discovered is that maybe, maybe clutter deserves a lot more attention than we've been getting it. So those are, uh, oh, and by the way, it's an interesting hand because that hand is called the Barrett hand. It actually goes back to uh, 
uh, papers written at the University of Pennsylvania about, I guess, about 20 or 25 years ago, uh, specifically starting with the same kind of argument that I'm addressing now, saying, at that time, saying, geez, there's these simple hands and there's these complex hands. We need a hand of intermediate complexity. And the Barrett hand is designed to do that. It has three fingers. It doesn't like the fingertip grasp so much. It can sort of do them, but it's really designed for the enveloping grasps. And uh, so it's a very interesting case in point. Well, let's see. So this is not the end of the talk. <laughs> Sorry. Conclusions could be a misleading, misleading title slide. Uh, just conclusions from this sort of mulling over is that I mean, all of the arguments in favor of complex hands are irresistible. They surely are potentially more general than simple hands. At the same time, simple hands are surely more general than we've been able to accomplish so far with autonomous systems. So uh, uh, I guess I feel encouraged that maybe it's a good idea, maybe we'll be able to go further faster with simple hands. So that's kind of uh, where I got to a few years ago. Let me um, go on then to the third topic. I mean, the question is, okay, fine, you're interested in simple hands, what are you actually going to do about it? How are you going to develop autonomous capabilities with simple hands? And um, we were inspired by a tool called a, uh, which we're calling a hardware pickup tool. This thing's so, so common that it doesn't have a name, so we're calling it the hardware pickup tool. Uh, you can buy them for 10 bucks in an auto supply store. Um, you know, they can pick up things. They're really good at it. They're amazingly good at it. Uh, you can just jab the thing into a bit of parts and let go and pull it out, and it's got a bunch of them, um, which actually is kind of a bug. It, it would be better if it got just one of them. But still, it can grasp a lot of different shapes, and when it grasps them, it's really got them, and it's pretty general. And, uh, um, but, you know, it has these problems, too. So, there are no sensors in it. It doesn't know what it's got or where it is, which, uh, for a robot, is a, real, uh, is a real problem. It also, I would say, it doesn't deal well with clutter, right? You'd like it to pick up one. You shove it in there and it just grabs everything in sight, you know, or within reach, I guess is, is the right word. Including, you know, seven screws instead of one. But if you had a bunch of nuts and bolts in there with the screws, it'd probably pick up some of them too. So it's got nothing going for it as far as clutter or estimating the shape. And it's also not very good at putting things down. I mean, of course you can put them down, you know, you open it up and the thing goes down. But if you wanted to put it down precisely, you've got a problem. It's really not designed for that. So, uh, but still, we were kind of impressed, and it occurred to us that if we could address the uh, localization problem um, and recognition, if it could recognize what it had, then we could address some of these other issues. So that's the question. Can we adapt this tool for a, a bin picking problem? So we're going to focus on bin picking. You've got a bunch of parts in a bin, uh, just randomly. And what you want to do is pull them out one at a time. And uh, how, do, how are you going to do that? So maybe, maybe we have a video here. Oh, I should have put the video there. Hang on a second. Where is the video? Sorry, real-time editing of talk. Not cool. So there's a bin of uh, highlighters. And here's a simple hand. It's uh, inspired by the hardware pickup tool, although you can see it's different. But it does have just three fingers. And it has just one motor. So one motor operates the three fingers in parallel. They're springy. And then each finger also has one sensor on it. So it does have a, it's a way of doing a sense of touch on the cheap. There's a, a known trick in robotics called, uh, um, I forgot what it's called, intrinsic tactile sensing. Okay, if you know how a finger has been deflected, then you can infer from that some information about where the contact is. 
So what we're looking at is it goes into the bin and it just does this blind grab, kind of like a hardware store gripper, and then it pulls it out and it shows it to this camera. And what it's doing is it's uh, noting the values of the angle of each finger and it's noting the result that it got using the information from the camera and it can associate that information and learn um, to interpret from the angle encoder information what it got. So that's the basic idea. Um, so one thing is here, we're not using a lot of sensor information. Um, what we're using instead is the knowledge that the object there is in a stable pose. If you have an object that you're familiar with and you know that it's grasped by your hand, that in itself tells you something about the location of the object. And uh, this idea goes back 35 years uh, to some work that happened at IBM Yorktown Heights. What they would do is they would take this, this part, this is actually part of an, uh, of a, of an electric typewriter, <laughs> and they would just drop it in this tray, and the tray kind of vibrated to reduce friction. And there's only six common stable poses of the part. So without, before it even looks at it, it knows it's got one of just six possible poses. And then it's got this uh, uh, tactile sensor, sort of a cat's whisker, and it could go in and it could say, uh, let me touch here, oh, there's nothing there, so it means it could be this, but it couldn't be that, and it does a kind of binary search with this cat's whisker to discriminate the remaining possibilities. So it's an old idea. Uh, it's actually been prominent in robotics research for many years, but uh, not very practical because uh, how did it get in the tray in the first place, right? Uh, it was already singulated and somebody put it there. Why put it there? Why don't you just go ahead and put it in the typewriter? And uh, well, 35 years later, <laughs> I'm still working on that. Um, and the idea is that the simple hand kind of addresses that because what you're doing is instead of the physics of gravity working with the shape in the tray to determine stable poses, you're using the springiness of the fingers uh, and the shape of the fingers in the palm, right? It's a different dynamics, but it's the same idea. There's only a few stable poses for a lot of objects anyway in our hand. And that in itself gives you a lot of information. And now all you need to do is disambiguate those possibilities using a very little bit of information from the fingers. So it's the same idea as the tilting tray, tilted tray, um, but in this case we've got the possibility of addressing those other practical problems because it can go in and grab the part out of a bin. Um, well, okay, lots of times it comes out with more than one. What do you do then? Well, you say, uh, the robot says, gee, I don't remember this pattern, and it just drops them back in the bin and randomizes and iterates. And so if that converges, then in the end you have one part, and you might also be able to decide where it is. So. What is the dynamics of this system? It turns out to be trickier than you might think. For example, um, I had a, a poor, unfortunate uh, postdoc <laughs> who was working with a simulation of a sphere in this simple design. No friction, springy fingers, and um, he could not get the ball to stay in the hand. And uh, I was pretty unhappy with him because it seemed like surely, uh, surely he could get this simulation to work right. And after a couple of weeks, we realized the simulation was working right. It's not stable. Okay, that there is no stable grasp for this ball in this hand. And if you generate this potential energy field, so this is the potential energy stored in each spring. There are these springs at the bases of the fingers. Uh, this is the potential energy field, and you can see there's a kind of uh, 
metastable point right here in the middle. It's a, a, a monkey saddle shape, they call it. And there's no reason for the object to stick in the middle. Um, but you can play some games with the design and fix that. So that's part of what we've been doing. Um, here's, uh, it's, it's much harder to do this analysis with three-dimensional irregular objects like this polyhedron. Um, here we've said, well, let's just assume that the object is resting on that one face on the bottom there. And then let's look at variations in x, y, and theta. And then we'll plot level surfaces of the potential energy. And when you do that, you'll find, uh, not so surprisingly, three different minima. There's a, there's a close-up of uh, one of the minima. So that has, well, we don't really know how many stable poses it has. Uh, and we haven't actually been able to prove this, but it seems certain that an irregular object is going to have uh, a finite number of stable poses in this hand. So that's kind of the fundamental logic that we're working with. Uh, there's the simulation. Uh, I don't know if the, I don't know the video, no. Um, and there's the prototype. I showed you the video of it. Um, the motor is, uh, I don't know where the motor is. Is that the motor? It looks like the motor. It's driving some gears. This gear drives a torsion spring. And you can see the finger here. It's pretty ugly, you know. Um, surely it can be made a lot, lot smaller. It's so simple. Uh, so we're working on that. Um, now the funny thing is, as simple as it is, and it's so obvious as the principle is, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, within about five minutes of putting this yellow block in the hand, we realized that things were not going to be so simple. Um, so one thing is that this is a funny kind of grasp. In fact, some people in robotics would say that's not even a grasp. And uh, I'll just draw one figure. Can you see this? If you, if you have a shape like this and you put fingers, say, here and here and here, okay, because these, and if it's frictionless, because these um, three contact normals converge in a single point, then you can squeeze as hard as you want, okay, without applying a net force on the object. And so this is this point people call a force focus. And uh, in some ways you could say that's pretty good. Uh, in other ways you could say it's not so good because if I apply a torque about this point, actually without friction, these fingers can't resist the torque at all, okay? And so what would happen is, in practice, is that if this thing is deflected a little bit because of frictional forces and other things, you would not get a sufficient restoring torque to defeat the friction, okay? Most of the time, at least in the literature, when people want to grasp an object like that, they would, they would put four fingers on it and then you've, you can resist the torques as well as the forces. And people call this, well, never mind. They, every, nobody can agree on nomenclature. Um, but in any case, if you have just three fingers, that's what we've been calling a, a higher order contact, a higher order uh, grasp. And we knew we were doing it. We didn't think it was going to be a problem. But, you know, even if you cover your palm with Teflon, and even if you use really shiny steel for the fingers, it's not frictionless. And, um, and so, actually, deflections on the order of a centimeter and ch angle changes in the order of, I don't know, five or 10 degrees probably, were not being restored. And part of the problem is when you look closely here, you realize that a wooden block with a really skinny little finger pushing on it, uh, 
there's some indentation going on there and it's probably kind of ugly. And I'm a computer scientist. I don't know anything about materials. You know, there's Young's modulus and stuff like that. Um, probably, probably that's something we need to worry about. And uh, I went and bought a book and that, so far that hasn't helped. <laughs> well, so at that point we thought maybe it's not going to work. Uh, it does actually work better than we expected. So um, let's see, I showed you the video of that. These things, I guess I already said all of these. You saw the video. We just watch it a little bit more. You know, the idea is that this could be a blind grasp, but the long range idea is not that it needs to be a blind grasp. You could use a vision system to kind of steer the thing towards a particularly productive configuration if you could recognize it. The reason for those fingers to be so skinny is so that it can penetrate this pile of clutter. And this is one of the observations that arose out of uh, Sid Srinivasa's work. We realized that clutter is so important, you can't just treat it as a collision avoidance problem. You can't postpone it to the end. It really figures in the design of manipulators and hands. So that's the thing showing it to the camera. Let me, uh, let me show you the kind of grasp that you get. So sometimes it comes up with zero and I guess we don't need to show you that. Sometimes it comes up with one, and typically you'll have the thing either lodged against two of the fingers, like on the left there, or lying alongside one finger, like in the middle there. And then sometimes, you know, the cap gets involved and that's a little bit different. Sometimes you get two objects, sometimes you get three. And um, what you want to do is recognize when you have one, and keep it. And if you have uh, zero, two, or three, you want to reject it. Um, out of uh, 200 trials, so we basically randomly went in there and grabbed stuff and showed it to the camera and then took some statistics. So out of 200 trials, we got about 42% of the time it was coming up with one marker. And, uh, you know, that's, that might be good enough. If it never came up with one marker, we'd be in big trouble. Um, we're using, uh, I would say, as far as I know, pedestrian machine learning techniques. Uh, it's not a machine learning project. We're consumers, not producers of machine learning. So uh, I'm going to say these things, but don't ask me for the details, okay? I'm sure somebody else in the room would know better than I how you do this. But we're training a support vector machine. So what we're looking at here is the encoder space, so encoder one, encoder two, encoder three. This is an oblique view and that's a, you know, what you would see if you were looking from the top. And this blob here is the decision boundary. So if it observes something that lies inside that blob, then it says, uh, I believe that to be one marker. And uh, outside the blob, it believes it to be two or three markers. And you can see some uh, the data that was used to train the blob. Um, so how well does it work? Um, I guess the way you do this, you divide the data set in half, you do it randomly, you do it many, many times. You use one half to train, you use the other half to test. Uh, on average, over all of these random divisions of the data set, uh, it was doing the correct classification about 92.9% .9 of the time. Uh, we were also uh, doing some regression to estimate the pose of the marker. You'd like to know where it is so that you can do the right thing with it. And uh, so if it recognizes a good grasp, uh, then uh, Then you do this K nearest neighbors thing, uh, just using the simplest possible metric in the encoder space. And uh, in this case, the way of testing is to do this leave one out cross validation and, and we're getting errors of, on, on average of around eight degrees. Now, uh, oh, and that's a, a histogram showing uh, how that, uh, 
how that works. So uh, I guess it's obvious what that shows, isn't it? Um, this should be deleted. <laughs> At one point, we, uh, we were confused <laughs> about the 180 degree uh, near symmetry. And so we misunderstood the data and thought that somehow it was miraculously being able to distinguish this from that. But that was just our error. It, it wasn't. We have a second prototype in progress. Uh, still testing it. Uh, it's using a different mechanism. It's using four fingers. We thought that might help with, uh, with this problem. So far it hasn't helped at all. <laughs> We're still learning. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit more that we've done since that I, I uh, don't have the graphics and so forth to put in the talk. Um, so there's some more interesting things that you can do. Uh, for example, instead of just saying do I believe this to be one marker? And if not, I will reject it. What you can do is you can say, uh, does this look like one marker? And is it in a pose that I can confidently predict its orientation? And if you're willing to play that game, then what you can do is you can crank up the accuracy at the but you lose time, right? You have to do many more trials. You're going to reject some just because even though you think it's one marker, you're not confident uh, that, you can, that you can recognize it correctly or recognize its pose. Uh, and that actually works pretty well as long as you're willing to spend the time on it. Um, let's see, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Oh yeah, so there's another interesting thing you can do. So we were learning based on all of the data that we had over the entire grasp. But you could go back and say, well, let's just look at the first half of the data. So I don't remember how long the graph takes. Let's say it's 10 seconds. Suppose you just look at the first second of data. And you train your SVM on that. And uh, if you get great results, that's super. Uh, probably you don't. Say you train it on the first five seconds. Uh, you might actually begin to get good answers after about five seconds, which means that the thing can go into the bin squeeze, start to come out and say, whoops, I already know I'm not getting anywhere with this one, right? And then they just kind of randomize and dive back in and, and try again. So uh, that to us is kind of intriguing because it really begins to look different. It begins to look more like, you know, you're fiddling around in the kitchen drawer until you recognize what you want and you pull it out. I think uh, fundamentally more interesting and it opens the door to the idea that we're going to learn not just recognition and localization, but even learn uh, behaviors. And that's a direction that uh, Alberto Rodriguez, the grad student that's working on this, is, is headed now. So we'd like to uh, be able to not just use some ad hoc motion to do the grasping, but to use a motion that's uh, tuned uh, in a uh, data-driven way, in the same way the recognition and localization is. So uh, that's our kind of preliminary results on the first, our first attempt to do autonomous manipulation with a simple hand. And uh, let's see, so I took some of the kind of speculation and BS on to kind of push it to the end of the talk, okay. Actually, I don't know what time it is. How much time do I have? Uh, I'm Five minutes, okay. And then I understand I got a lot of time for questions, in case anybody has any. So, uh, there was one other event that happened near the beginning of this project, was that uh, a guy who I was hoping would give me money, and didn't, uh, asked me, uh, uh, isn't grasping a solved problem? And I actually didn't have a good answer for him. Uh, you can see demos online, you can see papers, where they've grasped a variety of objects several times in a row and it looks pretty good. But somehow we don't seem to have any uh, common language or metrics. We don't have precise language. We don't even seem to have agreement on the definition of a grasp or on how central is grasping to manipulation. Based on Julia Child, I would say maybe it's really not so central. 
that seems like an answer that's, I mean, a question that's so fundamental, it's hard to imagine that we can proceed without answering it. Um, uh, one paper that, that did explicitly define by what they meant by a grasp was by Saxena et al. a couple of years ago. They would pick up objects and they would hold them and if they held them without dropping them for 30 seconds then that's their definition of a stable grasp. And the remarkable thing is that you can go through the literature and almost nowhere do you see papers that actually bother to you know to give you their definition of what they mean by uh, a stable grasp. Um, what else uh, is important in a grasp? Uh, do you want to be able to control the object in the fingers like this? Um, there's a lot of things uh, and, and in thinking about that we kind of came up with a bunch of characteristics that seem potentially important. Uh, so stability, obviously. Capture is something that actually people almost never talk about. So let me back up and, and tell you what I think is the uh, sort of dominant paradigm, how people usually think about grasping. Uh, I have an object here. Um, let's say it's there. That probably won't work. Nope. Okay, I'll put it here. Okay, I know the shape and I know where it is. Let me calculate a placement for the fingers to, you know, using the mathematics behind this diagram. Let me plan places to put fingers to give myself a stable grasp. And I will then move my fingers to those places and then I will squeeze a little bit and bingo, I'm done. That's sort of the, uh, the dominant paradigm behind grasping research. 